Transmitter device activating. Coordinate set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and development of the DC multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Now, we are still in 1967, the Summer of Love. Today, we're reading one of the stories from issue 79 of Lois Lane, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane. We haven't had a Lois story for a while, and you'll be delighted to know that this one is going to provoke just as much discussion and conversation (laughs) as uh, (laughs) the most recent one that we did. This comic was published on the 26th of September 1967 with a cover date of November 1967. Peter, would you like to tell everyone about the cover? I would be delighted. We are inside a church. It's a yes. beautiful church. You've got stained glass windows in the background. There's a lovely shimmer of light coming through from almost a high up window. Mm. And it's illuminating Lois Lane, who is a bride. Yes. How romantic. I know. But she's not marrying Superman. She's marrying a strange figure with a very dark costume with a T on his chest and a hood Mm. over his head. And there's the minister there. He's looking a bit worried. Superman is in the foreground looking rather casual. Yes. And Lois Lane is saying, Superman, stop my wedding to Titan Man. I just found out the terrible secret his mask is hiding. And Superman says, Serves you right for choosing him over me, Lois. Marry him. And there's a little caption box at the bottom that says, Featuring the Bride of Titan Man. And you're right, it's a gorgeous looking church. You know, the stained glass windows, the the bunches of flowers everywhere, the rest of the the congregation and stuff. It's lovely. And it's worth pointing out, listeners, this cover's by Neil Adams. Yay. An an artist who revolutionised comics. And this is the first Neil Adams cover that we've done. There'll be a fair few along very soon, in rapid succession. Yep. But this is very exciting, because Neil Adams is probably... Is he my favourite comic artist of all time? I think he actually is. I'm going to have to track a copy of this comic down for the podcast. The fact that it was the cover was by Neil Adams certainly sweetened the pill. It's a beauty. And wedding covers, that's an interesting sort of subgenre of comics. Yes. We're going to stick a gallery of wedding covers up on the socials, mm-hmm. listeners, so keep your eyes peeled for that. There are quite a few wedding covers featuring Lois Lane. I could probably do a whole gallery of Lois Lane wedding covers as well, but I won't. I'll spare you. It's a cracker. So yes, Titan Man. Interesting. When I got married, I had a board up with lots of different comic wedding covers uh, just to entertain... Uh, me? People, to entertain my guests. <laughs> to entertain me, because yes. I was probably the only person who appreciated it. That's right, because you had the one... <laughs> you had that brilliant Legion of Superheroes cover with the wedding sticks. <laughs> yes. I remember that one. You had the, the Barry and Iris... Stop course, yes. one, didn't you? Yeah. Stop, uh-huh. I'm trying to remember uh-huh. which other ones. Oh, and quite a few. Mm. There was a Namor one in there. Obviously Clark and Lois. Yes. A few of those, actually, because there are a few of those. Yeah. There was uh, Scott Summers and Jean Grey. So they weren't uh, all DC? That's terrible. <gasps> they weren't all DC? <gasps> Gosh, <Gasp>. I know. <laughs> Somewhere from the marvellous competition. <laughs> So that's just an insight there, folks. There you yes, go. there you go. If you're planning on getting married soon, consider doing that. Yes. <laughs> Let us know and I'll help you pick out some comic covers. <laughs> Terrific. I had a great time at PC's wedding, it must be said. Anyway, shall we just jump into the story? Let's do that. Get it over with, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, The Bride of Titan Man is the first of three stories in this issue of Lois Lane. We have an opening splash panel which shows... Titan Man, we tell it's Titan Man because he's bringing his hood, and he's breaking out of prison. He's wearing prison fatigue, stripy trousers, and he's breaking down the big grilled door of his cell. Lois is beholding this, and she's saying, Superman, you've come to rescue me from this crazy jail, and why on earth are you wearing that mask? Uh, you are Superman, aren't you? And this hooded masked figure, you might have guessed Titan Man, is saying, No. Just a man who adores you, Lois. I want to take you to my world and marry you. Gosh, now we have a caption box at the top of all this that says, The one thing Lois Lane wants most is to become the wife of a magnificent mass of muscles named Superman. (laughs) Her wedding day finally dawns, but the groom is not the Man of Steel. He's a handsome hunk of hero, all right but one with a dark secret which Lois doesn't discover until she's vowed to become the The Bride Bride of Titan Titan Man. Man. 
terrific. And there's a lovely little signature from Kurt Schaffenberger in the bottom right-hand corner of that panel. We love Kurt yes. Schaffenberger because he drew a lot of Shazam stuff Absolutely. in the 70s. One of the artists who was poached when Fawcett Comics closed down. I'm a big fan. It's nice we're doing another one of his stories. We should also mention, actually, in the background of this panel, behind Lois, there's a poster bearing the legend, Repent Your Crime and What Looks Like Lois Lane, knocking over, knocking down a very small policeman. So bear that in mind because that might come into things later on. So Yes. Gosh, right, so Lois is in prison, interesting. Right, so, anyway, over the page, top of page two, the caption for the first panel says... As Lois Lane greets a new day... Excellent panel of Lois sitting up in bed, stretching as her alarm clock goes off with a bring. And as she stretches and yawns, Lois says... <sighs> oh, golly, how I hate getting up in the morning. Same old routine at the office... The next panel, she's sat at her kitchen table, enjoying her breakfast. She looks like she's got some poached eggs or fried eggs. She's pouring herself some coffee, and she's saying, I just remembered. I'm going to enjoy it today, interviewing Superman and what he thinks of modern girls. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't really like doing Lois Lane stories. <laughs> <laughs> they just, they upset me on a level. Anyway, so, panel three. A scene setting caption says... At the Daily Planet. We see Superman stroking his chin. Lois has a tape recorder. She's holding up the microphone. She's obviously asked him the killer question because as he strokes his chin, the Man of Steel is saying, My opinion of modern girls. Well, uh, Lois says, Go ahead, Superman. The tape recorder is getting every word. Now, the caption for the next panel says, Meanwhile, Jimmy Olsen is also conducting an interview. And this panel shows Jimmy Olsen sat at his desk, also looks like he's got a tape recorder, and he's interviewing a young lady. Now, this is a very, very slim-looking young lady, it must be said. Elfin haircut, big eyes. And she's in the process of saying to Jimmy, What do I think of your girls in the States? Just simply ripping in a sort of bigger way. And Lois obviously overhears this, because we see her in the corner of the panel, and she's thinking, It's Twiggy! What she got, I haven't got more of. Yes, Twiggy. I don't know how famous she is nowadays. She gave me some details on Twiggy. Twiggy is a very famous, or was, is a very, very famous fashion model in the 1960s and the 1970s. She moved into acting as well. A quick potted Twiggy biography coming up. She was born on September the 19th, 1949, which means this comic was published a week after her 17th birthday. Gosh. She was born Leslie Hornby. There you go. Twiggy's real name. Pub quiz okay. question. Do you remember when we used to go to pub quizzes, Peter? Those were the days. We used to win them as well, listeners. Yes, we used to go to pubs. Yeah, we were great. We were good at those sort of things. And the sort of the story of Twiggy becoming the icon that she became starts when she had some photographs taken by a chap called Barry Latigan after she got her hair cut very short. And these were hung in a posh London hairdressing salon that was called Leonard of Mayfair. And Daily Express, which is a, an English newspaper, one of their fashion journalists called Deirdre McSharry was in this hairdresser's, saw the photographs and was struck by young Leslie. And she basically wrote an article which called Leslie the face of 1966. And that was it. That was her off. You know, she was encouraged by a boyfriend to change her name to Twiggy because she had a childhood nickname of Twigs because she was, her sort of signature look is that she was very thin. There's no other way of putting it. Yeah. Short hair, tons of fake eyelashes, you know, going on. That, that was her sort of signature look. Very angular sort of looking lady. She wore dresses that accentuated her shape. And she became very, very famous very, very quickly. A real icon of the 60s. And what's interesting is that apparently she, she made her first visit to New York, to the States, in March 1967. So that's only a few months before the comic was published. Ah, interesting. You know, six months before the comic's published. And then she's already appearing in DC Comics' Bible for Young Girls, Superman's Girlfriend, Lois Lane. <laughs> and more recently, and by recently I mean in the last 15 years, Twiggy <laughs> was a guest judge on America's Next Top Model. Yes, she was a regular judge then. Are you a regular viewer of America's Next Top Model? Might have been at some point. All right, I'm not judging, I only ask. I have a vague memory of my mum, not that Twiggy came up in the conversation or house very often, but I remember my mum being a bit dismissive. There was a lot of talk about how girls having to try and copy her mm -hmm. and how unhealthy that might be and 
But anyway, you know, that's not really the subject for podcast, but it's a bit of context because it does play out a little bit in the story. So, Jimmy is interviewing Twiggy. Lois is a bit unimpressed. But I've got to say, the fact that Twiggy is just sat talking to Jimmy in the Daily Planet office is hilarious. Yes. Uh-huh. I think that's brilliant. Twiggy making her DC Comics debut. Her Husu entry is coming soon. Yes. It's actually worth mentioning at this point, another type of British icon, coincidentally in issue 79 of Jimmy Olsen, um, summer of 1964, there's a story, the headline, it's something like the red-headed beetle of something thousand BC, something like that, isn't it? He's in ancient Rome, ancient Greece, something like that. Of 1000 BC. 1000 BC. Yeah. It's just a shame this isn't a Beatles podcast because we might have covered it, but it's worth pointing out. There's also that really famous Batman cover that's based on the cover of Sgt. Pepper and all the rumours about Paul McCartney being dead. Remember that one? Yes. Have you got a copy? No. No? All right, I'm surprised. No. My Batman collection's tiny, but that's one of the few that I've actually got. There you are. Anyway, that's enough talk about Beatles and Twiggy. Back to the plot. The caption for panel five on page two says, Wait! There's someone else on the scene, and he spells danger! Outside the window of the Daily Planet. This is a very interesting panel, actually, because it's just a window frame. There's no detail around it. Kurt Schoenberger was tremendous. There's a sort of snooping bad guy, essentially. He looks as if he's attached to the window somehow. Yeah. And he's holding around his neck. It's a weird sort of camera-looking device. Mm-hmm. And he is thinking... The anti-Superman syndicate offered me 50 grand to try out this new annihilation ray on Mr. Muscles. Here goes. It's supposed to blast him into another dimension and cut down his power so he can't even catch a turtle. We see with a sort of zzz sound effect that this bad guy from the anti-Superman syndicate has activated his device. Lois, hearing the sound, whirls her head round and says, Superman, look out! We arrive at the top of page three. The caption for the first panel says, The Man of Steel takes the full impact of the powerful ray, but it ricochets off his indestructible body and grazes Lois. Yes, it's a see what you see caption with a zzz and then a pow as it deflects and another zzz as it strikes Lois. We see this beam. Lois screams, strikes her square in the chest and she falls backwards. The caption for the next panel. Instantly, the luckless girl reporter is caught up in a whirling vortex and feels herself spinning through space. Again, it says what we see. We see Lois tumbling upside down through a whirling vortex and she cries. What? What's happened to me? And then the caption for the next panel says... Then, her senses still dazed by the shocking experience, Lois fuels herself on solid ground. We see Lois standing on a on a street corner, essentially. She's put her hand out to steady herself and lean against the building. Her other hand is up against her head. She looks very dizzy. And she says... I... I'm not sure where I am, but it looks familiar. The next panel shows her looking up at a sign on the outside of a building. She's expecting the Daily Planet, but this sign says, The Daily Dimension. And Lois says, Why? I'm in Metropolis, right outside the planet. Dig that. But wait, that sign doesn't say planet. The next panel, Lois has turned around and she can see another sign outside another establishment that says, Perry's Pizza Parlour. She can see a gentleman inside flipping a large pizza base wearing a chef's hat. And Lois says, And... Great Scott! That place used to be a soda shop. Now it's a pizza parlour with Perry, the owner. Perry White, of course, the the editor of the Daily Planet. Very exciting. So now over the page to the top of page four. Lois is clicking her fingers and saying, I've got it. Somehow I've landed in what's called a parallel planet. A planet identical in almost every way with Earth itself, but with mixed up variations. That accounts for all those strange similarities I've seen. Hmm. Caption for the next panel. Suddenly... And Lois twirls around because a voice behind her on the street says, Look, everyone! Just look at her! Lois reacts in surprise. The next panel shows Lois leaning against the wall of another building and she's being pointed at by a very... There's another way of putting it, I'm sorry. A very skinny young lady in a sort of checkerboard-style dress, a big necklace around her. There's two or three other very skinny young ladies. The first girl is pointing and saying, Did you ever? Just look at her! Ha <laughs> ha! And then another very skinny young lady says, Catch her figure! She's ridiculous! Yeah, there's a couple of other very skinny gentlemen, it must be said, stroking their chins and beholding Lois and contemplating her. Lois, with her back against the wall, says, Get grief! All of the women here are skinny! Like Twiggy! Twiggy? Yes, good grief. That's a bit of a coincidence, isn't it? 
In the next panel, a couple of the skinny young ladies, the two who spoke in the previous panel, are walking off arm in arm with a couple of the skinny gentlemen who were standing around. And the first girl in a checkerboard dress says, Isn't she just awful compared to me? And the chap in a blue suit who was in her arm says, Uh, of course she is. And then the second girl who spoke at Lois in the previous panel, she has the guy in a black suit in her arm and she's saying, Don't you think she's a fright? And then the guy who's with her replies, Uh, what else? But then the final panel of page four shows the two gentlemen looking back over their shoulder. The guy in the black suit is saying, Woo woo. And the guy in the blue suit says, What a babe. Hmm. Do you not think that's very much like the, the meme of the guy and his girlfriend? Yes. And the guy turning around to check out <laughs> the other girl. And she's raging at him. It's hilarious. Amazing. It is, yes. Except these two skinny girlfriends haven't noticed. No. <laughs> this is the precursor to the 60s equivalent. Kurt Schaffenberger invented the jealous girlfriend meme. <laughs> Amazing. They don't tell you that at school, do they, kids? Anyway, so we're now at the top yep. of page five. Now, this is where we have to be careful here. Do you remember when we did the Lois Super Babysitter story and we kind of toned down a lot of the <laughs> the language and the terminology? What we have here in the next sequence of panels are some very short policemen. We're going to use the term small people. A technical term that might still be used is dwarf. They use the words in the comic, which we're not going to use because it's now basically essentially considered offensive. Again, it's another indicator of just how things have changed, isn't it, Pizzi? Yes, absolutely. Huh? So, the first panel of page five, a few skinny people are standing on the street and a couple of very small policemen are shoving past them and approaching Lois Lane. And the first of the policemen says, All right, everybody, break it up. And the second one says, What's going on here anyway? Then they've approached Lois in panel two and one of them says, Huh, looks like a mighty suspicious character to me. Where's your ID card? Lois says, ID card? But, but, I don't have one. I don't belong to your crazy world. I'm from Earth. She, she doesn't have an ID card, says one of the small policemen. His colleague says, A breach of regulation AR4723. You're under arrest. Come along. Lois is surprised and says, Huh? And one of the small policemen grabs her by the arm. This next panel, Lois shoves him away, saying, How dare you pull at me, you pesty little kid, you? The policeman falls back with an oof, and we see in the background that his colleague has got a camera. Looks as though he's taking a photograph. That's probably the poster that we saw in this opening splash panel. And the next panel, it looks like the small policeman on the ground has actually recovered, and he's pulled out a weapon, which he's pointing at Lois, and he fires it with a zzz, and it's a burst of energy, and he says, You ask for it, lady. I'll give you a taste of my dazzle gun. Lois recoils, saying, Oh, the brilliance! It's blinded me! I I can't see anything! Now in the final panel, bottom of page 5, a couple of other very small policemen have arrived and they've lifted Lois up and it looks like they're carrying her towards the police car that's in the background of the panel. One of the policemen says, Easy now, she may be dangerous. As they're carrying her along, Lois is thinking, They're taking me somewhere, my eyes, dazzle! Yes, indeed, Lois. They start bearing it off towards the police car, which has written on it, Parallelo Police Department. Is that what that says? Yes, interesting. Yes. Interest- that is interesting. Obviously, a weirder than a parallel world. <laughs> the, yes, that's, it's a bit of a tale, actually. Over the page then, top of page six, the caption for the first panel says, When Lois regains her normal sight... We get another bit of see-what-you-see dialogue from Lois. She says, Why? I'm in a prison cell. Yep, we can see the sink, we can see the mattress, we can see the big heavy cell door, we can see the prison bars on the wall, we can see the crack in the plaster. And a voice of an angry small policeman from off panel says, You bet your overgrown life you are. The nerve of you calling me a pesty little kid and resisting arrest. Now, I'm not going to act out his dialogue from the next panel, but I'll report it. He's looking very angry. It's a beautiful, clear Kurt Schaffenberger image. It's gorgeous. He's wagging his finger, haranguing Lois, and the dialogue says, Anybody can see I'm a midget, a very normal midget. All the policemen on this planet are midgets because the records show that we, we folk, never turn to crime. Now you'll stay here until it's time for your trial. So there you go. There's another Lois wedding cover when she's getting married to a sort of dwarf version of Superman. Oh, yes. We've talked in the past about how characters like Dr. Hans from Black Hawk and Tom from Green Lantern were very much sort of 
easy target racial stereotype. So it's obvious at this point then that, you know, mm-hmm. small people, shall we say, were still obvious targets as well. It's another one of these things that's a bit uncomfortable to read 50 odd years later. I like how you're still referring to him as Dr. Hans and haven't reverted back to Chop Chop yet. No, because Dr. Hans. He's still currently Dr. Hans. <laughs> Dr. Hans. Dr. Hans, close friend of... Dr. Fate, the French one with the moustache, and of course Dr. Midnight and Dr. Occult, and our friend Dr. Fate. And the other Dr. Fate that Peter's colleague Gary mentioned once, who's the guy that goes around opening English garden parties. Yes, there you are. <laughs> so, the caption for the next panel then says... After the short slow man leaves... Lois is in her cell and another woman has appeared at the sort of grill that links Lois's cell and the adjoining cell. And this woman is tapping on the ground and she's saying... You can't push the police around up here, you know, Lois replies. Oh, hi. Tell me, what are you in for? And the next panel, we're in the other woman's cell. She's gesturing at a massive poster on the wall, and very helpfully she has some see-what-you-see dialogue. She says, can't you see what I'm in for? I stole a space sled. The idea is that if you're constantly reminded of your crime, you'll be sure to be sorry for it. She gestures at this poster, which is the, the legend, Repent Your Crime, and it looks like a photograph of her climbing into a space sled, which just looks like a very fancy American car with some fins and stuff stuck on it. Yes. So the next panel, Lois can see now that on the wall behind her, there is a poster of her with the legend Repent Your Crime, and she's knocking over the small policeman. And Lois says, I see they didn't forget to decorate my cell. Well, it's better than no wallpaper at all. Weirdly, though, the poster is obviously taken from the chap with the camera earlier on, but it's a entirely different <laughs> angle. Yes. It's from the angle of the reader. Yes. As opposed to the angle that the photographer would have taken the picture at. Yeah, it should have been the other way around, basically, shouldn't it? It's <laughs> interesting. It's it's very meta. Yeah. Maybe they've got some high-tech cameras, these uh, short policemen. I don't know. So, yes. Then at the bottom of the panel, calling from off-camera, a voice yells, Breakfast! And in the next panel, we see that a little table has been set in Lois' cell. We can see one of the short policemen outside. Lois looks at the stuff on the table and she says, They they call this breakfast? Soup? Steak? Ice cream? (laughs) Wine? That sounds like an amazing breakfast. I can't lie. (laughs) That's a breakfast of champions. Lois' cellmate through the wall pipes up with, You should see what we have for dinner. That's the best meal of the day. Orange juice? Cereal? An egg? It's great, honey. Hmm. Very strange things happen in this parallel world. So, we arrive at the top of page seven, and the caption says, Her meal over, Lois looks down into the recreation yard. Yep, this is another cracker from Kurt Schaffenberger. We can see that it's obviously a mixed prison. Yes. And they're very advanced in this parallel world. There's lots of men standing around wearing blue denim shirts and stripy horizontal striped black and white trousers. There's a guy reading the newspaper. There's a few other guys just sat against the wall. There's a small policeman guard with a gun walking along the, the tall pink wall of the prison yard. We can see the building appears to be made out of pink bricks. And at the foreground of this panel, there's a very burly-looking blonde-haired chap doing press-ups. Lois thinks as she looks from her cell. What a crazy place. The only one exercising is that strong and handsome specimen. Strange how he reminds me of Superman. If he could only rescue me. The caption for the next panel says... Next moment, as if an answer to Lois's thoughts... With a whoosh, the muscly blonde guy has appeared on the window ledge of Lois's cell. Lois again is turning round to behold him and she says... Huh? You couldn't have gotten up here unless you flew. But it won't do you any good. You can't get in. The next panel, the muscly blonde guy is grabbing the bars of Lois's cell and pulling them apart. And he says... Oh, can't I? It's worth pointing out that this panel of of him in the window of the cell is very similar to the earlier panel of the bad guy hanging outside the window of the Daily the Daily Planet. Yes, absolutely. It's a nice touch from Schaffenberger. Uh-huh. They could have easily drawn a, a, a you know an outside panel box around it and had the wall detail, but it's, it's, it breaks up. It's different. So the next panel, as we arrive at the bottom of page seven, the blonde muscly guy is inside Lois's cell. He's starting to unbutton his shirt. Lois says, "You're not from this world. That's clear enough. Who are you, and what do you want?" I'm from a nearby planet. I came to study this one and allowed myself to be imprisoned. You're in trouble. So I'm here to help you. Next panel, he has pulled his shirt wide open, showing a close-fitting top, which is a very angled sort of T on his little chest, which points downwards, and he's saying, I get my name from my powers. I'm the most powerful mortal in the universe. Titan Man. The most 
powerful mortal in the universe. What does that remind you of? Well, it certainly reminds me of Captain Marvel, but yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that's deliberate. Anyway, over the page mm. to page eight. Titan Man stands revealed in his full costume. It's a sort of dark green, the T's and orange, he has a belt. There's weird cutouts, it looks like, on his shoulders and round his arms, obviously to demonstrate his muscles. Mm-hmm. And we see the bent bars of the cell window in the background as he's saying to Lois, I saw you from the courtyard and my super telepathic power revealed your name. Lois Lane. Your name has eight letters, the same as mine. Eight. The most important number in my life. Lois is clasping her hands. She looks delighted. She says, That's a real gone coincidence. Eight's always been my lucky number. The next panel, Lois has her hands up to her face. She's looking very dizzy with it. Titan Man is leaning in. He's putting his hand on her shoulder and he's saying, My heart told me there was a bond between us. There is such a thing as love at first sight. Can't you feel it? Lois thinks. This is crazy. The, the, the way my heart's beating when I look at him. Yet... We've just met. I can't live without you. Come with me to my planet as my wife. And we get Lois looking very dizzy as heads of Superman and Titan Man are spinning around her. And she's thinking, What's happening to me? I've always been in love with Superman, yet now I can hardly recall what he looks like. I can only think of Titan Man. The very dizzy Lois says, I accept. Now the next panel. We get some helpful see what you see dialogue from Titan Man. He's gesturing with his hands, he's raised them up, and it looks like some bolts of yellow energy sapping out from them. Lois says, Why, what's happening? What is this? Titan Man helpfully says, I'm using my dynometric force to create a spherical field to protect you from the dangers of deep space. Next panel, with a wham! He's got some rope from somewhere around this spherical field, trailing Lois behind him as he flies off, saying, And now, let's go! Lois says, Oh, what power! He's more super than Superman! We arrive at the top of page nine. This story's breathless. It's very exciting. The caption for the first panel says, Through trackless space at terrific speed. Yes, we see him speeding along. Titan Man is putting a mask on. Lois says, Such mighty strength and so handsome, but why is he putting on that hood? And Titan Man responds... Yes, and his speech bubble has a sort of jaggedy quality, almost if he's broadcasting it, because in fact he's responding, saying, in inverted commas, I can hear you telepathically, Lois, and I'm answering you in the same way. On my world, this hood is how I hide my real identity. The next panel shows them still in space, Lois still being dragged along, but they're flying down towards another planet. And Titan Man is saying, Here's my world now, Lois. I'll announce our engagement at once. The caption then for the next panel. The news that the great Titan Man is about to take a bride electrifies the planet's populace. Yes, so we see Titan Man and Lois Lane standing on a balcony. He has his arm around her. There's a massive crowd in front of them. And Titan Man is saying, And here she is, my lovely wife-to-be, the gorgeous Lois Lane. And the crowd cheers. Hooray! Hooray! Three cheers for Lois Lane! Hooray! Yay! Hooray! Crowd noise. There's hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. Things move very quickly. For the caption for the next panel at the bottom of page nine says, The wedding day comes, and with it, a surprise for Lois. We're inside that beautiful church that we saw on the cover. We can see the guests all sat around. Tight man is still in full costume. Lois is in a lovely dress. Very fancy veil. She's carrying a big bunch of flowers. And tight man is gesturing to the, well, to the, <laughs> the seven bridesmaids that have come in. Behind, wearing pink dresses and nice little headdresses, different haircuts, different hair colours, all holding bunches of flowers. And as he gestures towards them, Titan Man says, Before we begin the ceremony, darling, meet your bridesmaids. Lois replies, Oh, how lovely they are. But tell me, why are they numbered that way, from one to seven? Yes, there's a sort of bluey green one, two, three, four, five, six or seven in the front of the pink dress. He's very charming. There's a fanfare playing in the background, as the caption at the bottom of the page says, continued on the second page following. We arrive at the top of page ten, and Titan Man leans in towards Lois, saying, Because those are my other wives, of course, seven of them. And he's got a giant red number eight that he's pinning onto the front of her dress. And he's saying, And you're going to be number eight. Oh my goodness, Titan Man's a bigamist. Good grief. The caption for the next panel says, 
Only now does Lois learn <laughs> that she's come to a planet where polygamy is legal. <laughs> Lois looks appalled. Titan Man looks quite happy behind his hood. Titan Man is saying, How lucky I was to meet you. The girl with eight letters in her name. The same as I, the girl whose lucky number is eight. The girl fate has chosen to be my number eight wife. Lois is having second thoughts, I think, here. She's thinking, Yes, but I don't want to be his eighth wife. I want to be his number one and only wife. The next panel is a sort of montage thing going on. Um, we see a little floating head of Titan Man, and he's saying, Lois, darling, I want to be great. I can picture our married life now. We have three little inserts panels. The first one is Lois standing at a door that's numbered eight, waving off Titan Man, who's flying off. Titan Man says, Since you'll be my eighth wife, naturally, I'll see you every eighth day. You'll be eighth in line for everything. The second insert, we see Lois sat at a table. We can see wife number six, and presumably wife number seven sat next to her. We can't see the number seven on her outfit. Wife number six is tucking into her meal. Wife number seven is taking some food off a plate to put on her own plate. Lois has her hands up to her face. She looks appalled. She says, The food never reaches number eight. I'll starve. The other wives are very greedy, aren't they? The final panel, this little insert, Titan Man concludes saying, At dances, you'll dance every eighth dance with me. You can see the, the wives number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all lined up as in the front of this little insert. Tight man is dancing with wife number one. We arrive at the bottom of page ten, and it's a very, very Kurt Schaffenberger panel of Tight Man and Lois standing with their shadows below them. But there's no other detail. There's no one else that draws like this. He's phenomenal. Yeah, I can't bad. wait till we do some Shazam stuff. Tight man holding his arms up, saying, "See, aren't you lucky to be number eight? Do you know where that puts you?" Lois is gesturing, looking very unhappy, and she says, Yes, right behind the eight ball. I wouldn't have any seniority. The other wives would outrank me. I want out. Final panel, page 10. Titan Man grasps Lois by the shoulders. There's a little waves of energy coming from his eyes, and he's saying, Now, now, you're just excited. My tranquilizer ray will calm you down while the ceremony proceeds. Lois thinks, It's... Draining all my willpower. I can't even run. I must stay and take it. Become <laughs> wife number eight. Oh my goodness, this is awful. We arrive then at the top of page 11, and the caption for the first panel says, And so the marriage ceremony continues. We see Titan Man and Lois. Lois looks very downcast, still holding her flowers with a number eight on her chest. Lois is thinking, Superman, how could I ever have forgotten him? The only man I ever really loved. Oh, Superman, help me, Superman. The priest who's doing the ceremony, you can see him reading from his Bible and he's saying, If anyone knows any reason why this couple should not be joined together in matrimony, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. Then, suddenly, from out of nowhere, the one and only man of might. Superman whooshes in. Lois looks delighted. She says, Oh, Superman, you heard. You're here. But then the next panel, we're at the cover image. Soups has taken a pew, quite literally. Lois is saying, You're just in time, Superman. Don't let Titan Man force me to marry him. Now that I know the dark secret he kept from me, I despise him. And a very relaxed Superman, with a big smile on his face, <laughs> says, Are you kidding? I'll be happy to have you married and out of my hair. Say your I do's, pretty Lois. Lois says, Oh! And then, the next caption. Suddenly, a strange dizziness as Lois feels herself once more caught up in a whirling vortex, spinning through space. Yes, she's upside down again, still in her wedding dress, falling through the vortex, twisting and turning, and she says, What's happening to me? The caption for the next panel. Nothing's happened to you, Lois. You're at the Daily Planet. You never even left there after that ray knocked you out, remember? And we're back at the Daily Planet. Superman is lunging forward, punching out the bad guy that fired the Annihilation Ray earlier in the story. And as he punches out the bad guy, Superman says, If she's hurt badly, I'll make you wish you'd never been born. Lois, looking very dizzy, has her hand up to her head and she's thinking, Then it was all a dream. I've been watching Twiggy when that ray hit me. <laughs> That's what triggered my dream of a planet full of twiggies, <laughs> where I met Titan Man. Closing panel, Lois is hugging Superman. She has her hand up round his head. She's kissing him on the cheek and she's saying, Oh, Superman, 
I'm so happy to be back here with you that I can't even get mad at you for not stopping my wedding. Mwah! And a very confuzzled Superman, scratching his head, says, Oh, now, what in the world is this all about? The end. end. Well, so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous amount of fun. Good grief. Is that the shortest story we've done? Certainly one of the shortest stories we've done. It's, Clocking uh, in at 11 pages. Yeah. Now, there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up here. Please do, please do. This is not the first time Lois has had a parallel earth experience. No. Because obviously there's that story in which she was flying the kite for the Jimmy Olsen fan club. Yes. And got struck by lightning and got taken into another parallel earth. And also there was a story where she came across the parallel earth super baby, the DH Superman. That's right. Now, interestingly, in that one, Superman from that parallel earth married both Lois and Lana. Again, polygamy in parallel earths in a Lois Lane comic. Yes. It's a weird recurring device, isn't it? Yes. It's interesting. It's fascinating. We talked before when we did the Lois Lane stories about, you know, our sort of worry about this was the sort of stuff they were peddling to little girls who we assumed yeah. were the, the target audience for Lois Lane comics. What were they trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's again, it's another story where Lois is just like portrayed as a crazy person who just wants to get married to Superman. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed actually, the splash panel where Titan Man bursts her out of prison. Yeah. He's wearing his hood, which obviously he isn't wearing when he does that yes. in the story. He just They fly through the wall. He doesn't actually break the door down. So that was, that was a bit of a cheat, I suppose. Mm -hmm. The parallel earth stuff is interesting. I mean, obviously, the Twiggy stuff, it's kind of obvious that that was influenced by the fact she was dreaming, you know, because she thought yeah. about it. But the parallel sign on the side of the police mm. car, that's probably a tell as well, that it was maybe a dream. Yeah. As a rule, we're not doing stories that turn out to just be a dream, but this is Lois, a story where Lois has a dream about being on a parallel world. So it kind of fits into our remit. Listeners, don't hate us too much for doing this. Well, it could be an imaginary story in which Lois imagines all this. But remember... The hood at the window said it was a device that was going to transport Superman into another dimension. Now, Lois wasn't privy to his thoughts. Yes. So it's a bit of a coincidence she imagines getting transferred to a parallel world yes. when she doesn't know what that device does. I think that's quite interesting. I think this is categorised, as you said, as an imaginary story. However, it could be taken as she was transferred to a parallel world and this actually happened. To that's her. exactly what I was going to say. I mean, she we see her getting zapped by the ray and it's possible maybe the ray only had a limited time effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it wears off and she's returned back to where she came from and she maybe just thinks it's a dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's on this other version of Earth, yeah. but then she's taken to another world where Titan Man lives. Yeah. So, you know, that's not even a parallel Earth that has the, the polygamy rules. It's another world True. in this universe. True, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by the fact that this has come up again, the, the multiple partners sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wonder what they were smoking or what they were thinking or, you know... Well, I'm quite concerned by Titan Man's roofy vision that he has. Yes. That basically, Lois is having second thoughts at the altar. He just gives her his uh, tranquilizer ray vision. Yes. To just make her comply and marry him. That's yeah. very sinister. It's dodgy. I mean, it's, it's mm. as bad as the Lois and Lana trying to condition Super Baby into falling in love with them. Yes. Uh -huh. It's teaching the readers, I suppose, that manipulative behaviour is... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> manipulative behaviour is a okay in our book. Yes. We this is the manipulative behaviour is okay in relationships podcast. I remember actually in my HMB days when I was on the fast track course and we did this sort of exercise where you had to kind of work out your key behaviours and one thing that emerged from my results was that I was too manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> Getting you so Western McCoy. Player of chess and a thousand boards and I was kinda of like, Well, you know, you could just call it influencing skills i don't know <laughs> but i don't think i would ever try and coerce a young lady into marrying me against her will i'm not that much of a of a rogue while standing at the altar in your black hood yes <laughs> with your seven other wives behind you yeah and a freudian tea over my chest yeah and yeah the magnificent seven i mean those those panels of lois imagining what her life would be like they were hilarious oh no stand over there other seven wives whilst i dance with wife number wife number one must be knackered because she's getting all the attention she must you know she's getting all the, the pickings of all the foods you know well at least she gets seven days off to recover that, that's that's true so that's a rota yeah they must all be glad then there's but an eighth wife added because that means they've each all got one day more to recover from true Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that he puts them through. My goodness me. It's Dancing seems to play a big part, apparently. It's, it's mentioned specifically. Yeah. <laughs>
I mean, again, we've talked in the past about how a lot of the Silver Age Superman family stuff was was quite disposable. And I suppose yeah. on a level, this is one of those disposable stories. But again, we have to talk about how, we, as we have done, it's it's just crazy. The messages that, you know, they were sending to to girls that were reading this stuff, you know, yeah. if girls were reading this stuff. Crazy. But, I mean, I love the Kurt Schaffenberger artwork. There's nothing yeah, like, there's no one like him. It's absolutely phenomenal, yeah. He's a treasure. I mean, mm-hmm. the layouts, the abandonment of traditional sort of panels. Sort of, well, obviously, we'll put some of those up on the socials so yeah. you can see them, folks. An embarrassment that Rich is in the artwork, to be honest. One other thing I wanted to mention as well is Lois uh, sets an alarm clock for 7 a.m., folks. In case you're ever wondering what time does Lois think about <laughs> that, her alarm goes off at 7 a.m. sharp. Pub quiz question. <laughs> Very interesting, though. Planet of the Twiggies. Yeah, we should talk about the fact that the men on the planet of the Twiggies were obviously their eyes were taken. You know, Lois caught their eye, uh-huh. caught yeah. their gaze. So maybe the, the guys on the planet of the Twiggies, or Twiggy, we'll call it. Mm-hmm. They're obviously they prefer their women to be a little fuller figured. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And I'm I'm still lolling at your observation that this was the invention of the the jealous girlfriend meme. Tremendous. <laughs> we don't have any contemporary reader reaction for this one, do we, Pedro? No, sadly, there's no letters commenting on this particular story. Which is a shame, but I'd love to have heard from all of Twiggy's fans. Yes. Of what they thought of her first and last DC Comics appearance. Her one panel appearance. Tremendous. Wow. <laughs> Twiggy, if you're out there, get in touch. <laughs> so we don't have any letters, sadly, for this low story, but there's another letters page that we're going to talk about. If you've been a regular listener, you know that one of the regular correspondents to DC Comics at that time was one Irene Vartanoff, who went on to become you know, a comics professional, doing a lot of work for DC. And in his researches, Peter has found something very interesting. It's a shorter episode this week, it's a short story, so we're just bringing this in as well, because it's quite interesting. This is from issue 15 of Metamorpho, is that right? Yes, it is. Published, listeners, would you believe, on September the 26th, 1967, the same day as issue 79 of Lois Lane. <gasps> Gasp. Pizzi, hit us with it. Okay, so, as we have said before, Irene Vartanoff was a regular letter hack. We've talked about many, many, many of her letters on the show before, and she was the subject of debate in many a letter column right. as to whether she actually exists or whether she was just like like a DC editor who would put in some filler letters. Interesting. So, there is a column in Metamorpho 15 that's devoted to her, and it's called The Great <laughs> Vartanoff Rumble. <laughs> Amazing. This is a subject of debate that primarily went through Metamorpho. But here we are. I'll just go through some of the the letters and comments here. Uh, It starts off with uh, the editor saying they're choosing up sides and fighting out the question of the century. Does Irene Vartanoff really exist? (laughs) So let's see which way the wind is blowing. And the first one says, Dear editor, I'm going to stick my neck out and take a stand in this Irene Vartanoff business. Ever since that girl started writing her chatty, informative, interesting, intelligent letters to DC... All the fandom seems to have arisen in arms. Nick Kurazi's letter in the August Metamorpho isn't the only one of its type I've seen. I don't believe that Irene Vartanoff really exists. With all apologies to Mr Kurazi, that sounds rather childish. Irene Vartanoff does exist. And that's from Rand B. Lee, I think we've had him before, from Roxbury, Connecticut. That rings a bell. That rings a bell. Here's a short one from Frank Bell from Tennessee. Dear editor, in one of your letter columns, Nick Kurazi insulted one of my favourite writers. Irene Vartanoff, I say to heck with Nick Karazi. <laughs> Next one from Carol Queen in Cheshire says, Dear editor, make Irene Vartanoff prove she's real. I don't think she's real. <laughs> and the editor chimes in with, Irene baby, I wish I could print a picture of you, as if that would prove anything. But since I can't, I'll give your fans the next best thing. A genuine Vartanoff postcard reprint in your own inimitable style. And underneath that, there is indeed... Uh, what appears to be a postcard that mm-hmm. says on it, Dear Editors, I exist! I exist! <laughs> Signed, Irene Vartanoff. <laughs> so there we are. If Irene Vartanoff didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent her. <laughs> the rest of the columns all just about Metamorpho, but there we are. Metamorpho is right. excellent, by the way. It's very much in the in the Plastic Man funny vein. It's, it's really good, although with a bit more superheroics thrown in. I had a few issues at one point. I don't know if I've still got them. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I've got quite a lot, so it's... Metamorpho will pop up in the podcast eventually, listeners. Don't worry if you're a fan. Yes. He's going to at least turn up in one of the JLA, JSA crossovers and probably at least one issue of Brave and the Bold that we're going yep. to do. Yep. And he'll rock up in the crisis, I'm sure, at some point. 
Mm -hmm. Very interesting there, Peter. Thank you for reportaging on the whole correspondence thing. Speaking of correspondence, if you want to correspond with us, <laughs> you can email us at the Earth 2 podcast mm. at gmail.com. You can check out our website. That's at the Earth 2 podcastcom where this episode and all of our others are there just for you to easily find. Make sure you follow us on social media because we always post up lots of extra bonus material on Facebook and Instagram. We're at the Earth 2 podcast and on Twitter. We're at podcast underscore Earth 2. Yep. And if you're enjoying what we're doing, we now have a coffee page. So you can find the link to that on our link tree via our Twitter page and our Instagram page. So if you like what we're doing, you can buy us a coffee. That would be much appreciated. We will spend it wisely. We might not even actually spend it on coffee. I'm quite fancy some marzipan right now, actually, now that I think about it. As usual, listeners, thank you for joining us. Look after yourselves. I've been Peter. And I've been David. And we'll get you next time on Titan, Titan Man's, Man's Polygamy, Polygamy Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime. Titan Man is still in full costume. Rois, Rois, Rois Ray. I'll do the voice of the priest. I've always wanted to officiate a wedding, actually. <laughs>